have one? You haven't started it yet? <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> yes. Uh, prayer for George. He's going for uh, some citizen papers in Boston tonight. Uh, so we want to keep him in prayer. And also Alex is not feeling well today. How's he doing? A little better? Uh, Oh, Lord, we just lift up George to you, Father. We ask for your divine favor upon him, God. We thank you and praise you that your favor will be with him. God, we thank you for answering our prayer. We pray in faith, believing. We don't pray in doubt. But, Father, we thank you and praise you that you hear us, Lord, because we're asking in your name. And, though, Lord, we just pray for Alex, Lord, for a continued touch upon his body, Father, and heal him of the, any sickness or disease, any bacterial, viral infection that's trying to get a hold of him. And we rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Thank you that there's healing in the, and power in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you for healing Alex. And we give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome to uh, Sajiv up in India, who's got a program uh, going on in March, uh, a, re a revival program. So keep him in your prayers. And we will be sending him some support money for that. So just remember that anytime we send him money for uh, outreaches, that those souls that are one to Christ are accounted to your uh, bank account, if I can put it that way, up in heaven. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to be starting in Lesson 9 tonight. And um, Lesson 9, I don't know if we have the same pages, because I think yours is an updated version of what I have. I think it's on 61. Is it on 61? Uh, 65, see, yeah, we're indifferent. Okay, well, anyway, we're going to be starting on, on, on ch uh, chapter 9 tonight, and um, but I, I'm going to be taking it from a little different perspective, so um, we're going to follow along. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the progressive mention principle. Last, uh, last lesson we, we had, uh, we were talking about um, the comparative mention principle. Tonight we're going to be talking about the progressive mention principle, uh, of how the Word of God progresses or how it changes, but not, it doesn't change the, uh, the truth of it. It just, it, just, um, it just amplifies the truth, and it brings the truth to light. So the definition of the progressive mention principle is this. It is that principle by which God makes his revelation of any given truth increasingly clear as the Word proceeds to its consummation. And so that's what's going to be taking place um, uh, in the progressive mention principle. Uh, I want you to read um, uh, all of chapter 9. Uh, there, you're going to see in chapter 9 about the, amplif the amplification of it. You're going to see the qualifications, the demonstration, and uh, the symbols and purposes, all those things. And there's many, many choices that are there, but I found some that are more in-depth and give us a, a better progression, I think. And so I'm going to be using... Uh, tonight from uh, a Bible course that was taught uh, on biblical hermeneutics by William Hallman. So I'm going to be using his outline. And so that's what we're going to be using tonight. So, uh, but it goes in hand with the book that you have here. So uh, bear with me, okay? The uh, progress of the doctrine of the New Testament, um, Bernard, uh, who is a theologian, who said, the reality of this progress is very visible and more especially so when we regard the New Testament as the last stage of that progressive teaching which is carried on through the scriptures as a whole. And if we glance from the first words to the last uh, in the Bible, you say, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the end of the book says, even so, come Lord Jesus. But there's a whole lot of stuff in between. Okay, you've got the beginning and you've got the end of all things, the new heaven, new earth coming into play when Jesus comes back again. Um, and so we have a lot that's going on there. Um, you'll see again the progress, but rapid, and, and it's unbroken. Uh, in the scriptures I'm going to be sharing, our steps before were centuries, now they are but years. It goes from the manger of Bethlehem on earth to the city of God coming down from heaven uh, with the great schemes of things. So we're going to see some great things tonight. Amen? We'll now look at some of the examples of the progressive mention principle. We're going to look at that right now. I'm going to be touching on three areas tonight of the progressive, um, the progressive mention of, uh, principle. The first one I'm going to be talking about and I'm going to be sharing with you is how 
you, I wanted to show you so that you can see from the scripture the actual progression of things. Rather than just trying to teach you a principle, I want to show you so, so that you can, when you start reading the Bible, you'll read it in a different way. You'll read it and you'll see that it's, it's a progression of things. So we're going to talk about three areas tonight. The first area we're going to talk about tonight is the seed of the woman. If you look at Genesis 3.15, The Bible says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Here we have the revelation that Christ is to be the seed of the woman. Everybody in agreement with that? Okay. This seed is to be bruised in the heel by the seed of the serpent. In other words, that he, it, it was going to cause physical pain. And suffering. And in turn, this seed will bruise the serpent's head. Now, does anyone know what that means? Is that literal? Or is that a figurative way of speaking? It's literal in the sense that he's going to bruise his head, but it's figurative because what the head represents is authority. Okay? So he says, I'm going to put, I'm going to. Put enmity between thy seed and, and his, um, between the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Meaning, you're going to cause suffering and pain in the life of this seed. So, if we look at it, this is a very first principle of mention here, of a progressive mention principle. That first and foremost, the seed is going to bruise the heel, but the heel is going to bruise the authority. We know that Jesus did that on the cross. Amen? Okay. In Genesis 12, you don't have to turn there, but I'm just going to give you the references. You can write them down if you want to. Genesis 12, 3, and Genesis 22, 18. A revelation is now given to Abraham. I talked a little bit about that Sunday, if you heard my message. That his seed is the promised one that shall bless all nations. Now, if you, if you look at that in Genesis, and you'll see that in um, 12, 3, that it says, and in, 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 in thy seed, it's singular, it's not plural. He didn't say in thy seeds would have meant his own, his own um, uh, offspring. But it was going to be a seed that was going to come through Abraham's lineage and that all the nations of the earth were going to be blessed. Um, aren't you blessed because of that seed? We all are, because if it wasn't for that seed, you and I would not be saved. <clears throat> so... Again, it says that, so now the seed narrows down from the human race, right? In Genesis 3.15, talks about the human race. It goes from the human race to one man and his posterity, to Abraham. In Genesis 17.19 and Genesis 21, verse 12, Abraham had two sons. I want you to see the progression now, right? How it's coming. And now it goes from Abraham, and now in, in Genesis 17, 19, 21, 12, Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Now God reveals that his covenant of a seed will come through Isaac. So there's no question that God has a plan and a progressive or a, uh, a way of showing us how that these things are going to start to come into place. It's going to start to unfold. So now we know that it's not Ishmael. We know it's not the, it's not the, um, the, the son of Hagar. Okay, we know it's the son, of Sarah, uh, the, son, the son of Sarah, the promise, right? So it's not the Muslims or the Islamic faith. So we know that, okay? And sorry about that if you're watching, but that's the truth, okay? Um, and then in Genesis 49... Verse 10, and Numbers 24, 17, Jacob had 12 sons, right? Okay. And now the promise is that the blessing shall come. Huh? Who said what? What did you say? I'm sorry? Oh, Numbers 24, 17, Genesis 49, 10, Jacob had 12 sons, and now the promise is that the blessing shall come upon Judah. 
So now he's going to a specific tribe, okay? He's going to come through Judah, and out of him shall the seed come. And then in 2 Samuel 7, 12, verses uh, 7, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 to 16, the revelation of the seed begins to narrow even further. It narrows down, and now we learn that it will come from the house of David. See how the progression's coming? First, it's a little ambiguous. You don't really know. It's a seed. It's going to bruise the serpent's head. He's going to bruise his heel. It's speaking of humanity. Somewhere in there, he's coming along somewhere. And now it's narrowing it down. It's saying, okay, it's, it's coming you know, through uh, Abraham's seed, and now it's coming through Isaac, and, and now it's coming through Jacob, uh, and now it's coming to the promise of the tribe of, the, of, of the tribe of Judah. And then now, in 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 16, the revelation of the seed even narrows more, and we learn that it is coming from the house of David. Isn't that cool? And so, you can also see uh, Isaiah 7, 13 to 14, and Matthew 1, 6. Matthew 1, 6 talks of the genealogy. And you'll see it that, there, that Jesus came from the, from, the, from the house of David, so forth and so on. And in Daniel 9, 25 and 26, Daniel 9, 25 and 26, here we have a revelation concerning when Christ would be born. You read it talks about the Antichrist coming. It talks about, remember, the twofold principle of prophecy. It can be for that specific time, but it can also be futuristic. We talked about that a, a while back. Well, that time when he comes, it says a time in the times and half a time. You know you can calculate that out during that time and go back 33 years because that's how long Christ lived on earth, and his birth was right at the right time. So we see that. And then Ma Micah 5.2 Watch how it starts to narrow down. The, the scope comes from here, and it starts to narrow down like this. In Micah 5.2, here we are told that the seed would be born at Bethlehem of Judah. I mean, are you excited? I get excited when I read stuff like that. Okay, now, now it's getting even better. Now we know. See, we know from hindsight because we've read the scriptures. He was born in Bethlehem. We know that. But when you start to study this, and you see how this progressive mentioned principle works, you can begin to take it into other areas and say, wow, look, this is how God did this, and then he unfolded this, and then he unfolded this, and then he unfolded this, then he unfolded this. And, and when you get to uh, Zechariah 9.9, we are told even more, that the scope narrows even more. So here we have the prediction that one would be, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Zechariah 9, 9 says, here we are told that the seed would ride into Jerusalem riding upon a colt or a donkey. I mean, that's getting pretty specific. When you start reading like that and you start looking at things like that, this, you, can, you can witness to people and people that are skeptics and say, oh, that's all hearsay and all that. No, 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 no. Look at how it runs through, all the way through. And it just begins to get narrower and narrower and narrower. In Zechariah chapter 11, verses 11 to 13, here we have the prediction that one would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Wow. You can also see Matthew 26, 14 to 16, and 27, verse 3. It gets even narrower. <laughs> In Malachi... Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Here we are told that the Messiah will be preceded by a forerunner. Amen? Malachi 3, 1 and 2, verses 1 and 2. And who was the forerunner of Jesus? John the Baptist. See, now you can put places and names and, and, and prophecy and, and the progressive mention principle in effect. In Psalm 22, here we see the manner of his death. 
and that there would not be a bone of him broken. Now you have to put yourself back in the Old Testament time and reading this and saying, who is this? Who are they talking about? You know. And then Psalm 16 God here revealed to David both the resurrection and the ascension of Christ. Wow. That's why when Jesus was talking to the two on the road to Emmaus, it says he went through all the law and the prophets and telling them of all those things that were speaking about him. Isn't that cool? Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing of we're going to talk about the progressive mention of principle. Now, I'm trying to go through this. I don't want it to be boring and lag, you know, kind of lag down, but I want you to get a, a gist of this. The second is concerning Christ as the Lamb of God. The record of the Lamb is woven into the very texture of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Well, watch this now. In Genesis 4.4, could you put that up, Genesis 4.4? And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, of the fat thereof. Now let me say this. Many commentators believe that that was a lamb. And I believe it was a lamb. Because I believe Adam and Eve, when they, remember when they were naked and, and they were afraid and God said, you know, the fig leaves that you sown for yourself to cover yourself and cover your sin is not good enough. He had to shed the blood of an animal, give them leather skins. I believe that was a lamb. How many know that God does things decently in an order? Amen? And so I believe that. And um, here it says, And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. So we see here that, that God accepted it. Now watch this. In Genesis twenty two thirteen, 13, here's the story of Abraham and Isaac. And they're journeying up to Mount Moriah. And during this journey where Abraham was told to sacrifice his son, right? But something happened as he was about to raise, as he rose that knife up and he was about to strike his son. Something happened. God provided a sacrifice, a substitution for Isaac. Are you seeing the picture here? Here's a lamb. Now the sacrificial lamb. And now a substitution. So God spared the son of, of, of um, Abraham and caused the substitution to take his place. Very interesting. In Exodus chapter 12, here we have the death of a lamb and the application of blood, a type of crucifixion. Remember when uh, the Israelites were celebrating the Passover and, the, and they had to apply the blood to the doorposts? Amen. Hallelujah. That was a type of crucifixion. Isaiah 53, 7. Now for the first time, you're going to see this begin to narrow down again. Now for the first time in the Scripture, the lamb is a man. A man slain for the salvation of God's people. He was a man of sorrows, it says. He is led as a lamb to the slaughter. So now the revelation or the principle of, of progression is, okay, we went to the animal sacrifice and then there was a substitution. And now... He is led as a lamb to the slaughter. Now they're thinking, wait a minute. There's something deeper than just the animal sacrifice. This is going to be a person. This person's going to be the substitute. There's for something, but we don't know quite what it is yet. Watch. In John 1, 
29 verses 30, uh, 29, um, cha John chapter 1, verses 29 to 33. John the Baptist now identifies the Lamb of God coming toward him by the bank of the River Jordan. When he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. So when you see, Behold, the Lamb of God, it's, it, it, it's, it's not just, just that incident of the Lamb of God. Now you go back and say, Lamb. Lamb. Lamb was signified what? What did, it, what did it unfold from? Where did it come from? It came from all of these things that I had just read to you where, where Abel was, was the one that offered the first sacrifice, if you will, and it was acceptable to God. It was, so, so now Jesus is, behold the Lamb of God. That's acceptable to God. Follow me? Hallelujah. Acts chapter 8, verse 26 to 39, Philip is sent from Samaria to the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza to meet an Ethiopian eunuch who is reading Isaiah chapter 53. And now for the first time, the lamb prophesied by Isaiah, is identified as Jesus, the Savior of Calvary. In 1 Peter 1, 18 to 21, here Peter gives us a great doctrine concerning the Lamb of God. He reveals, A, the four, four, uh, the four ordination of the Lamb. In other words, it was predestined. God already knew about it the manifestation of the Lamb, the resurrection of the Lamb, and the glorification of the Lamb. Let's look at that. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 21. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers. Next verse but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. Because you know as you go back again that the sacrifice had to be perfect. It had to be without blemish or without spot. It had to be a perfect lamb. He said without blemish, without spot, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb. Now he's doing a, he's doing a comparison there and he's bringing you back to all of these things of what took place. And to a Jew, they knew that. Okay. In fact, if you take Isaiah 53 and you read it to a Jew, they'll tell you, stop reading the New Testament. And all you have to do is turn it around and show them you're reading from the book of Isaiah the prophet. Because they already know that that's, we are talking about who you're talking about. Okay. Next verse. We're going to go to verse 21, okay. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. God already knew what he was going to do. But he was manifested in these last times for you. For you and for you. He was brought to the forefront for you, for me. Next verse. Next verse, please. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Now everything is coming into play. Now look at this. Go to Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. We're going to put that up for you. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe
These things were not accidental. This was progressive all the way through the Old Testament. Come on now, somebody. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Hallelujah. In other words, he's worthy because of who he is. Here the lamb is identified with the lion of the tribe of Judah and his coronation is revealed by the hosts of heaven. In Revelation 22, verse 3, this is the last reference to the Lamb in the book that's truly being called the book of the Lamb. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. So you still see the, the correlation or the, or the metaphor or the typology of Christ being the Lamb, innocent, without blemish, without sin. So when people say, how do you know Jesus was sinless? You have all of these things that you can bring, bring out and say, this is the reason why. So check this out. In Genesis chapter 4, we talked about it, we have the lamb for an individual. Abel, right? In Exodus chapter 12, we have the lamb for a household. Remember he said, all those who are in the house and the, the blood is on the doorpost, the death angel will pass over and nobody will die. So we have the lamb was good for one person, the shedding of the blood of that lamb. Now we have it good for a household. In Leviticus chapter 16, we have a lamb for a nation, Israel. And in John chapter 1, we have a lamb for the world. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, saith, Behold, the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. We had a lamb for an individual. We had a lamb for a household. We had a lamb for a nation. And now we have a lamb for the world. Hallelujah. That is amazing. That includes everyone. And to those who are teaching replacement theology that Israel no longer exists, that's a lie. He is the savior of a nation, Israel. All the promises he made to Israel, he will bring to pass. And if you doubt that, read Romans 9, 10, 11. Let me repeat that. That, that bears repeating. In Genesis chapter 4, we have a lamb for an individual. In Exodus chapter 12, we have a lamb for a household. Remember in Acts it says, if you believe, ye and your household shall be saved. The first and foremost evangelism you must do is your household. It's your uncles, your aunties, your cousins, your nephews, your, your sisters, your brothers, your mama, your papa, all of those things. That's the first evangelistic outreach you should make is your home. Because it comes to individual, you, then to a household. Then you support those who will bring the lamb or the revelation of Jesus Christ the Messiah to Israel. And then to the whole world. That's why he said, go ye into all the, and preach the gospel. That's including Israel. That's awesome. All the Old Testament sacrifices were both typical and educational regarding the Lamb of God, the Redeemer of the world, 
The sacrifice must be a man. We found that out. And that man must be sinless, perfect, and holy. God could never be content with the mere blood of beasts. The sacrifice must be his infinite son. And the third thing I want to share with you tonight is concerning the trinity of the Godhead. How the progressive mention principle brings better light to that. Genesis 1.1, you can put that up there. Now you would say, and I know others would say, the, the word trinity is not in the Bible. That's true. But the ideology of it is. And you'll see it. Here's a scripture. <clears throat> Reading it as it is. In the beginning, whenever that was, people ask me, when was the beginning? I say, in the beginning. That's when it was, right? It wasn't any other time. It was in the beginning. But I don't know when. It was in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, do you know that right in that one scripture, you have a trinity of trinities? Did you know that? In the beginning, you have time. Time has past, present, future. God created the heavens. You have space, breath, width, height, and the earth. You have matter, solid, liquid, gas. The word God here is from the Hebrew word Elohim. It is a, it is a uniplural noun. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We all agree. Are we all in agreement? Who created it? Okay. All right. Go to Ephesians 3.9. Keep this in your mind now, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Go to Ephesians 3.9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, who created all things by So if he created all things with the beginning of the world, and he created all things by Jesus Christ, Genesis 1, 1 says, and God then the conclusion has to be that Jesus Christ is God. Isn't that cool? Look at, look at the uh, Colossians. One, chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. For by him, meaning Christ, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, Visible and invisible, space, matter, time. Whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Go to 17. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. John chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. Gets better. We'll go to verse 1. Let's, let's just go right to, the, right to the meat of everything. Verse 1 there. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis says, right? Well, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God. 
That word with is pros. And in Greek, that means face to face with. And the word was God. Whew, I'm telling you, Revelation tonight. Verse 2. The same was in the beginning with God. Next verse. Look. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Go back to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God. So the logical conclusion to that is that Jesus Christ, is God in human flesh. It's not a mythical wish or people, this fairy tale belief. It's factual, scriptural proof. In the Hebrew language, we have singular, dual, and plural. Here it is in the plural, meaning more than two. <laughs> Woo! So Genesis 1 1 gives us the first hint of a trinity of persons in the one Godhead. Now, let me say this we don't believe in three gods, tritheism, we don't believe that. We believe in triunity. One God existing in three persons. When we say persons, we get all messed up. In essence, in nature. In Genesis 1.26, go there. We have the plural pronoun. God said, now remember, God said, God speaking, right? God said, let us, the angels have not the ability to create. So God is talking to someone. And either he's schizophrenic or he's talking to someone other than himself. And he said, let us Make man, and here's the plural again, in our image. In chapter 11, verse 7 of Genesis, can we get that up there? Go to let us go down and there confound their languages. I mean, they'll understand one another's speech. Here it is again. Let us, not let me, I. But you say, well, Pastor, though, it does talk about the first person in Isaiah. Was it chapter 9, I believe it is? It talks about me and I. Yeah. When God's talking of his person, he speaks I, me, my. When he speaks in his being, it's us, our. So you have to know the both. In Matthew 3, verse 16 and 17, the Old Testament gives us hints and intimate intimations of the Trinity. But now in the New Testament, we get a fuller revelation. Here we have the Son, Jesus, in baptism. Right? And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens opened up to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Verse 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, 
This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Right? And so you have the you have the you have Jesus being baptized, you have a voice from heaven and the spirit of the dove coming the, the spirit of God coming on him in the form of a dove. Is the Trinity right there. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 28, verse 19, here the apostles are told to go out and disciple all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular. It would have said plural here, it would have been names, it would have been Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it would have been different persons. But because it's name, singular, to go and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. In 2 Corinthians 13, 14, Paul's triune benediction, you can read it, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So you see that there. See how things of progressive mention principle begins to unwind, and it just, it's, it's just revelation and inspiration that comes when you start to put it all together and you go, wow, man, that's awesome. So we talked about, <clears throat> first and foremost, we talked about the, the, uh, concerning Christ, the seed of the woman, that we talked about concerning Christ as the Lamb of God then concerning the Godhead, and now concerning the predictions of, of Satan. In Genesis 3.1, 3.2, and 3.14, he's called the serpent. Now, everybody thinks snakes are bad. Snakes are not bad. It just happens to be the vehicle that Satan used Okay, Satan is not a snake. Can I tell you that? If Satan was a snake, then you could kill Satan, because you could kill a snake. No, he's not a snake. But that's the vehicle that he chose to use to manifest himself in the Garden of Eden, was a snake. He used the snake to talk through, to talk to Eve, to talk with Adam. So he's called a serpent. That's not the only place he's called a serpent. We'll get into that <clears throat> later on. But what is a serpent? What does he do? He slithers. He's subtle. A snake, when he is very cunning, you know, a snake will kind of just waddle his way up, you know. He'll come up, you know. He'll look at you. <laughs> then he gets you. Unexpected. And I gave Jeanette a heart attack. Yeah. In Genesis 3, 1, he is subtle. In 2 Corinthians 11, 3, put that, put that verse up there, 2 Corinthians 11, 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his sub subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So one of the things that the devil does, and see, as he's compared to a serpent, he's very slick, very sly, you know, kind of just weaves his way into things, you know, just kind of. And what does he attack? 
your mind. Genesis 3, 4, he's a liar. So he's talking to Eve, he says, oh, God didn't say that. He lied. You shall not surely die. Wait a minute. What did God say? What did God say to Adam? Come on, let's go back to first principle mention. What did, what did God tell Adam? Of all the trees in the garden you may eat thereof, but there is one tree you cannot eat of it, and the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. He said this, you shall surely die. The, and see, some people t get mad at me if I correct somebody that uses one word. They say, it's only a matter of semantics. But can I tell you, one word can change the whole entire meaning. See, God said, you shall surely die. All the devil did was add one word. Not. Just one word. Changed the entire meaning and the entire direction of humanity. With one word. Wow. You know he's a liar. He's the tempter. In Genesis 3, 1 to 4, you see how he tempted the woman in the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Look good. Everything looks good. You've know, got to have it. Got to have it. Got to have this. The devil will lie to you. You've got to have this. You've got to have that. And what happens? You go into debt. You go into further debt, go into more debt, until what happens? You're ruined. That's what the enemy does. That's why he hates it when we talk about how to live right, how to live within your means, how to, how to structure your life so that you bring glory to God. He hates that. And so as we unveil this and as we go through this, you'll see the blessing on the other side. He is the accuser. You see that in Job. Go there for a minute. Job 1, 9 to 11. Then Satan answered the Lord, and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Hast thou not made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. He's an accuser. Now, why did God allow Job to be tested? Why did he do that? To whose benefit? Huh? Job? You know the devil's not omniscient? You know the devil doesn't know everything? But God does. And God knew that Job would go through this okay. Because God knows the beginning, the middle, and the end. And he said, okay, go ahead. Because he wanted to prove the devil wrong. And show him just the kind of liar, and deceiver, and manipulator, and accuser that he is. And the devil even tried to use Job's wife. That's why, wives, be careful what you say to your husband sometimes. When he was going through all of that, he lost his children in accidents and storms, his cattle, his livestock, lost everything he owned. As he was, as he was you know, going through one tragedy, another servant came in and said, your other son's house down the street. He, he, he lost his life, and, and those that were in his house, they all lost their life, and they came and stole everything that she had. Wow. Then another servant came in, 
and said, your other daughter and her house and everything, they were, and that, that song came over there and killed them all too. And he threw dust on his head. He said, what was his words? He said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then all of a sudden he started getting boils all over his body. Tremendous boils all over his body. And he used to take shells to cut the pus out of his body. And he just laid there sick as a dog. And his wife comes over and says, Hi, honey, is there any way I can make you feel more comfortable? <laughs> now, what did she say to him? Why don't you just curse God and die? Wow, what a loving wife that is, huh? Guess you must have had a big insurance policy on him or something. Why don't you just curse God and die? So you silly woman, shall we not take good from the Lord and bad that comes our way? You wouldn't curse God. So guess what? God won, devil nothing. He passed the test. In Zechariah 3, 1 to 2, let's look at that, Zechariah 3, 1 to 2. I want to show you that, that, that principle of progression. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing in his right hand to resist him. He's known as the hinderer. When Sanballat and Tobiah opposed the building of the wall, yeah, doesn't it? There's some U.S. Tobiah and Sanballats in the U.S. Congress stopping the building of the wall. I, I just, I just got to regress for a moment because you know. I have to make this statement, okay? All these people, and I, I said this to somebody one time. They said to me, uh, I forget where I was, but it, I, this person wasn't a Christian. I think we were somewhere, and we, the news was on about building the wall, and they go, I don't believe in building walls. I think we, don't, we shouldn't have to build any kind of wall to keep people out. I said, do you have a fence around your house? Mm, yeah. I said, do you lock your car door and do you lock your door in your home or do you leave it wide open? No, I lock it. Well, why? Because you're trying to keep bad people out, right? Hmm, I never thought of it that way. But that's what we need to think about that way. Amen. Hallelujah. He's a hinderer. That's his characteristic. He wants to hinder you. He wants to hinder your relationship with Christ. He wants you to stay as far away from Jesus as possible. And he'll use anything and any method he can to get your mind, like we read it before, lest you be deceived like Eve was in the garden through the simplicity of your, in your mind of the simplicity of Christ. He attacks your mind. He's a hinderer. He's the sifter, Luke twenty two thirteen. 13. He's the instigator of lies. I'm just trying to run because I don't want to go too late. He's the worker of satanic power of signs and lying wonders. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9. Look that up. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9. Even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Don't get caught up in the signs and wonders. Don't get up, you know, don't get so caught up. In, yes, we want to see miracles, signs, and wonders. Yes, God says he would. Yes. God said he would do those things, right? These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Yes, we understand that. But there are coming lying signs and wonders even in the heavens. Okay? And I don't care if you see the Virgin Mary in the sky or you see it on a piece of pizza. That's not her. It's a demon. Yes. Now, 
now mm -hmm. program on TV called the healer is a guy just going around healing people that are sick all of that is setting up the stage for the false lying signs and wonders the gold dust falling down how many people got caught up in that? Where is it today? Where the angels aren't dancing in heaven anymore? So that's what they said it was. You know, the streets of gold in heaven, so the angels were dancing, so it shook the heaven, so now all this, the dust came to earth. Okay, so that's not there no more. Where's the feathers, all the feathers? See, people are hungry for the supernatural. But what happens is, is when that hunger turns to curiosity, they're looking for something. You'll find something. He's called the great dragon. And, he's, and look at Revelation 12, 9. Revelation 12, 9. And that great dragon... Was cast out that old serpent, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Now, let me say this. What's his number one job? Huh? You've heard me preach it, you've heard me teach it many times. The number one weapon he uses is deception. He deceiveth the whole world. In other words, all those who are unregenerated, those who will not receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, those who will not live for God, guess what? You're under his deception. He's deceiving you. Oh, this isn't true. That's not true. What if it's not true? You're wasting your life away. Why serve God? Why give him your heart? You only go through disappointment. All of that, the lies. That he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. This is the final attack against Israel that the devil's going to make. And he's also a leader of rebellion. He's a leader in rebellion. For you to rebel against God, for me to rebel against God, for the church to rebel against God. And how does he get us to rebel against God? causes us to be like the world. See, the Bible says, love not the world, nor the things in the world, for if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Hear me. That's not Pastor Bob. That's Scripture. Love not the world, nor the things in the world, for if the love of the world is in you, the love of the Father isn't in you. I don't care how much sweet-sounding words come out of your mouth saying you're a Christian, saying you're serving God. If you love the world more than you love God and you love the things of this world more than you love God, the love of the Father is not in you, and that's why you don't have a relationship with Him. Anything you own should be up for, up, I should say, up for auction. If God was to call for it at any time and say, I need that. I, well, I, I must, I didn't get, I got one squeaky amen over here. <laughs> but are there any questions about the progressive meth, meth, uh, method or the progressive mention? principle. You see how things unfold? Look look at look that way in scripture. Begin to look that for that. Why how does it say why why is it let, let's go back and look at it. Let's see where the principle of first mention. And let me say this the principle of first mention goes hand in hand with this by the way. And as you start to see that you see the 
like the sun, the moon, and the stars. We talked about that. But let me say this. Not always will the sun and the moon and the stars represent Israel. Sometimes God's talking about the heavenly hosts, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Sometimes in Scripture you, you'll see that. So you've got to be careful that you don't get so stiff on that. But there are times when you see it in connection with the 12 tribes of Israel, or you see it in Revelation chapter 12, right? The, the woman with the sun and the moon and the stars, and then you go back to Genesis, you see Joseph had the dream with the sun, the moon, and the stars, and that's Israel. So you can combine that together. But sometimes it's not always that way, so you've got to be careful. Amen? Are there any questions? Did you enjoy that? Okay. Good. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We ask you, Lord, to be with us and be with our families. Keep us in good health. Father, we pray for travel and mercy that you be with us tonight. And we give you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you on Facebook.